All right. So if you've ever wondered what it looks like to invest from a distance, either as a passive investor or actively buying a building yourself, and what does that look like to be doing it overseas or to be in a whole other continent? Well, my friends today, Michael and Susie, that's exactly what they've done. And they built wealth through investing passively and actively uh, over the pond, as they say, right? Like overseas. So I'm uh, really excited to have you guys here today. Welcome, welcome. And uh, excited to have you on the show. Absolutely, bro. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Really excited to be on your show and share with your listeners how to invest from anywhere in the world. That's awesome. Yes. Love the energy. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit of your guys' story. We were just talking and like, I'm headed to Patagonia, Chile tomorrow to do a hiking trip. You were just there. You went to like um, Antarctica and you were hanging out with the penguins and like, now we called Michael is now a doctor. So Dr. Michael, give us, give us like some of your story. These are like snippets, but like, tell us a little bit like how you got here and like, give us the background. Yeah. I mean, the biggest, I guess, thing to it all was COVID like over on this side of the world, our lockdown, um, was much longer than in the U S and Michael and I were like, okay, well, what are we going to do? Right. Everybody's been sent home from work. Like we're just at home. What do we do for a lot of our extra time? If we can't go outside and do a lot of stuff. And, um, Michael and I decided to do a mini book club with each other. The first one started as the slight edge and then it progressed to multiple streams, of multiple streams of income. Yes. By Robert Allen. And the second like portion of the book talks about real estate investing. And Michael just looked at me and he's like, we should try this. And right when we found out that everyone and everything real estate related had gone virtual, we knew that like we had the greatest opportunity to network, to meet people, you know, to show up because that's what we had time to do. And so that's what we did. Like we were attending networking events every week. We were attending as many conferences as we could, because as we all know, like flying back and forth for a conference every month would have been crazy. And so we just took advantage of all of that in meeting people. And then like all of that combined, right. To kind of make it come to fruition. Sorry, I can't say the word. <laughs> <laughs> so that like we closed like as lead sponsors over here on an 88 unit. That was our first one in Oklahoma. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that, there's a lot there. So COVID, obviously life hands you lemons, you turn it into some lemonade, you continue to grow and you learn it. It's kind of a common theme I see amongst a lot of like real estate people, whether they're active or they're passive investors, it's just the growth mindset, right? And that book, The Slight Edge has become one of my favorite books. Like it's just, yeah. you do little things each day and it has an exponential effect over the long term. And if you do negative things, that is an ex exponential negative effect. So, uh, so that's how so you started developing uh, through conferences and networking, and this is all during COVID. So how did that work? So you guys were studying in England and you closed, as you said, you were a lead sponsor, right? So you're a lead sponsor. Yeah. So were you traveling back and forth to that or like, you couldn't even travel for a while, right? So how are you, you doing even that? Travel. Yeah. yeah. So how did that, how did that work? Yeah. So obviously because of COVID, we couldn't travel that much as we just talked about, but like, um, it, so the, we had to, for the very beginning, we knew that we were going to have a difficult time traveling because of COVID and restrictions, stuff like that. So we just uh, decided to really start reaching out and developing strategic partnerships. And so we actually had a boots on the ground, uh, who's an old classmate of mine uh, from the Air Force Academy, um, who has actually ended up being our boots on the ground in Oklahoma. Uh, so Oklahoma City and Tulsa were kind of the markets we were looking in. And so we developed that relationship with him and, you know, uh, he would be basically be our eyes and ears on the ground, if you will. Uh, we knew everything from, well, you know, from the, from the information that we've learned at that point, we knew everything we needed to look at when we we're looking at a deal and stuff like that. And so we basically were able to share with him what we needed pictures of what we needed videos of and things like that um, during, during the pre LOI phase. And then obviously during due diligence as well. But then even for like broker relations, right, it was just calling them like weekly just to catch up, right? Because we couldn't meet in person, like to add that extra layer of, I guess, intimacy. So it was just calling them weekly and being like, hey, how are you? Like, how has your week been? You know, you said you were doing this last week, like, how did that go? And it was just maintaining the relationship that way. So that we also were like, top of mind, because that's the biggest thing, right? It's like, if there are 15 LOIs presented or even sometimes, right? There's like 30. It's like, how do you remain top of mind? And so that was the way that we did that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. And this is something I think a lot of people 
uh, you know, traditionally in real estate, there's kind of been this rule. A lot of people have done it where it's like, oh, you got to be within two hours of your property and and all that. And I heard that for years. I've been in kind of real estate meetups for a long time. And and then I I just kind of like realized that I couldn't, you know, I, in California, I couldn't buy things that made sense. It was just like stupid prices and stupid, you know, like it was like negative cap rates or just when you actually look yeah. at how it works. So that's why we own most of our stuff in Florida. Everybody's like, how do you do that? It's like, well, you have team members and you've got, you're going to get on a plane and you go and it's, but the nice yeah. thing is when you are at a distance, I think it actually gives you the ability to scale more quickly and more easily because you have to develop a team. So now you right. have a choice, right? If you could go and you're two hours away, where are you going to go and you fire your team and you go to do something different. And of course that can happen, but the idea is you, you're so dependent on a team, but I think um, really in a way it, it can make you more passive. And, you know, Warren Buffett talks about that saying, and, you know, unless you make money while you learn to make money while you sleep, you'll work until you die. So I know that's something that you guys do is you're trying to help people to develop passive income. So talk to us a little, talk to me a little bit in our audience, a little bit about how uh, you see passive investing work. How's it working now in multifamily talking about return on impact investing. There's a few questions there. So we want to take that. Yeah, I can definitely start with like the return on impact part. Like from the very beginning, and it all really came from the slight edge, right? It was like doing 1% better every day. And so that's how we go even into our real estate investments. Like when we talk about it with like future passive investors is um, like, how can we create the community to be 1% better every day? Or how do we make it 1% easier for their lives, right? Because it's like housing is a basic need. And so if we can make that one step easier so that they don't have to worry, like the residents don't have to worry about all the time, what does that mean, right? And it's like making sure that maintenance orders are complete on time, making sure that the residents have a say when it comes to um, some of their, the amenities, right? So like after we close, we'll just do a quick survey. Hey, like, these are the four things we were thinking, right? And the property manager is doing this. Like, can you vote? And so like, they feel like they have a say in that or when it comes time for renewals and they we there's an increase, they also get a say on like what upgrades they have, right? Like we were gonna do them anyways, but so we're just adding a layer of them to get to choose so that they can make it feel like it's a home. But like, it goes beyond that. Like, how are we educating the property management company to know what a syndication actually is? <laughs> yeah. right? then, like at the very beginning, um, our property manager kind of assumed that Michael and I were the ones with the money. And I was like, that's that's fun. I, I, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> I was like, but it works so much differently. So like yeah. when you involve everyone, you make an impact that way. Cause like, even now, just for example, one of our property managers is completing her first burr. And I was like, this is so exciting. Like she had no idea what that even would, was before I was like, Hey, it's just through this little bit of education. Like you can do that too. So that's how, like, when we go into it, it's like, what is the return on impact in each investment? Like, here are all the things that we're doing that really makes a difference. This is really what your money goes to. Like, yes, you help build wealth, but like you're building wealth in different ways with other people as well. Yeah, um, that's really good. And I love that you guys are educating. And I've seen a lot of your stuff online. I'm also an educator. And obviously, this is educational. You guys have a podcast as well, which I encourage everybody to check out as well. Um, what What was the biggest challenge for you? to get started. Cause again, I, I think going from zero to one in this business is the hardest, right? To get from like, you're calling brokers and like, no one's calling you back. And then once you get your first deal, it's like all the brokers are calling you, right? Like they're like, all yeah. one of them. so like, so what, what was like for you? Like, what was that process like for you guys getting started? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so we first started getting into it. I won't get into all the details, but like we, we initially, what I call like we had a false start with single family. Um, we started looking at, we were going to get into single family and stuff like that. Uh, long story short, it didn't work out in the end, but we decided to pivot uh, into multifamily. And we, then we started just showing up to all these networking events and conferences and stuff like that. Well, while we were showing up, uh, the biggest thing for us is like, we just told everybody, you know, you know, what properties, what kind of properties we were looking for, what markets we were interested in and everything, like everything, you know, we had our criteria laid out. Um, very, um, we thought about it very thoroughly and yeah. just told everybody about it. Right. Which then that led us to being introduced to people or other operators who were in the markets that we were interested in investing in. Right. And so we then from that point stumbled on to, uh, or got introduced to our mentor, like an organic mentor. Um, he was kind of doing bigger and he was kind of progressing, uh, doing bigger and bigger pro uh, properties and things like that. And so we were kind of coming in and he was kind of 
there to hold our hand, if you will, and like uh, check out our underwriting, be able to provide information on the market and stuff like that uh, from information that we didn't have, but he had because he was actually invested in the area. So that was probably uh, the biggest thing that- um, That was the most difficult. That was the difficult. That was the most difficult. Okay. Yeah, I was getting to that. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so the most difficult thing is getting your foot and door in the market, right? And that is how we actually- um, helped us get into that market is, is by developing an organic mentor you know, yeah. through that process. Yeah. Yeah. Did you drop the fact that you're like a doctor that, you know, like, that that <laughs> all? like I'm really smart. So that, did that help at all? Or it didn't really, didn't really mean. Drop I mean, so I think Bronson, I think the biggest, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't say that. No, but uh, I think the biggest thing when I, when we started developing that relationship with this mentor, which kind of got our foot in the door in the market was that we continuously showed up, right? Like he would say, Hey, underwrite this or here, tweak that. And we did it. And then we got back to him, you know, within a day or two and providing him with feedback. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to continue working with you because you could continue to show up day after day after day. So I know you're invested. I know you're serious. And I want to help you out because I'm not going to put the time in if, if I know that you're not going to actually put the time in as well. Right. So, yeah. And that's a common theme. We've heard people that, you know, uh, when you're working with brokers, it's just, you got to, you know, you got to get back. You got to get an answer. You got to, even if you don't like it, just give them a, Hey, this is great. But you know, thanks for thinking of me. This is, you know, I'd like something more like this. Um, so let's, let's talk for this. Um, talk about this for a minute. I know a lot of people are curious today. Uh, multifamily uh, has taken a hit as far as interest rates. They keep going up. Um, it's single family, you know, the payment amount from a 3% to a 7% is 41% higher total payment you count escrow and escrow insurance, those different things. So what are you, what are you seeing as far as multifamily? Are you guys still buying more stuff? Have you slowed down? Are you selling? Like, what are some things, like, how are you looking at it now? Is, are you, are you looking for more deals? Like what's your, what's your approach right now? For us, we're continuing to look at deals, we're continuing to underwrite deals. I think the biggest thing we're looking for right now is, uh, well, the, the properties that make the most sense are just, um, properties that offer, um, loan assumptions. Uh, where people got like lower interest rates, you know, in the past two years, and then they're uh, allowing a loan assumption on the property. Um, for us, like, because there's not a lot of things that are kind of underwriting to the cash flow that we like, because obviously most of the cash flow is now eaten up by the higher interest rates. Um, I, we're not really seeing where we where we're looking at. We don't we don't really see property prices coming down too much, but more of like a plateau and maybe a little bit of coming down a little bit. But the great thing about what you mentioned was that, well, I wouldn't say the great thing. It's kind of like a, I don't know, server lining, if you will. Like, I don't even know if I want to call it that, but like <laughs> because people can't afford to buy single family homes anymore or not as many people can afford, um, we're seeing a increase in occupancy rates in our property. Yeah. Um, so like a lot, a, lot, a lot of our properties are close to hundred percent, if not right there, like 98, 99, 100%. Um, but I think that's probably due to the fact that a lot of people are not can no longer afford to buy a single family home or, or qualify for a loan, unfortunately. Yeah. So. yeah, I think it just comes to like also like trying to come up with more creative ways for financing. Right. It's like, OK, before it was very easy, like the cash flows there. Like are the numbers that we have are there and we can get that with regular financing. Now it might be just like different conversations with sellers and that's totally okay too, right? It actually probably keeps it more entertaining to like, see what we can come up with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, makes, that makes sense. But no. I was just to say that as far as like how we're underwriting deals, I just mentioned this to your audience right now. It's just like, obviously we're increasing expenses uh, quite a bit higher than we normally would underwriting just because we know that cost of goods are going up with inflation and everything like that. Um, and as far as rents go, we are, we are not being very aggressive at all with those increasing maybe one or 2% per year uh, where we would typically hit like 3% roughly um, just because I don't know where it's, what's going to happen in the next six to nine months as far as uh, everything goes. But like, if people are spending more, or excuse me, if, if cost of goods are going up, we also don't want to burden our residents with a higher rent as well. Um, and so that's what we make sure. And that's that kind of loops comes full circle with the return on impact thing. Like there's several of our properties, as I mentioned, that are at 100%. So when typically when you're at an operator operating a property at 100%, that means your rents are too low. Uh, but at this point in the, the market cycle, 
we've chosen not to increase rents. Uh, we're still giving the returns to the investors that we that we said, uh, but we, we chose at this point not to increase rents until we kind of see where everything shakes out with the economy because we don't want to burden our residents as well during this yeah. time. Yeah, it's interesting balance though too. I think a lot of people um, are just really curious what to do. There's a couple articles that have come out. Bloomberg has said that Americans are holding five trillion dollars in savings right now, and it's five times what it was uh, just you know two years ago. So all these stimulus, all these different things. So all this money in the sidelines. I think it's an incredible time right now to buy. And I think the reason why is because I think that in the next three to six months there could be some sort of pivot. Uh, lowering of rates and what's going to happen when rates, when late rates start to lower, uh, I think asset prices are going to start going up again. I think yeah. a, a, typically it's only, it's between five and 13 months every single time. It's never been longer than 13 months that they've raised from the first raise to when they start lowering and the average is five months. So it'll be a year in March. So I think we're kind of right on that cusp. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any opinions on that about, uh, because obviously the Fed is such a big part of the interest rates. Do you guys have any opinion on, on that as far as what will happen there? Or is it just kind of wait and see? So I, I'm very optimistic um, as well, Bronson. I, I think we're, we'll start to see, and we kind of already see it right now, right? So, um, well, in the, was it three weeks ago now? So this is, we're recording at the end of November, 2022. Uh, but just three weeks ago, we saw that the, uh, the CPI for October came out, which was lower. Uh, so inflation was lower than was predicted. So we saw the the the, uh, the stock market kind of shoot up a little bit that week, uh, and then we also I also saw information from Freddie and Fannie are uh, kind of backing down their yield maintenance requirements and things like that. Um, so that to me was very positive. Um, I do see a light at the end of the tunnel for the raising of the rates, and I, I do see we're going to plateau or kind of start coming back down um, over the next several months. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to. Uh... To watch. Um, so I wanted to talk just kind of for a couple more things. I think the, the biggest lesson that I can see from you guys is just the ability to be passive and to be able just to start, to start doing it. I mean, a lot of people I think that are passive are like, oh yeah, I need to get into it somehow, or they know they should take action, but there's a lot of analysis paralysis and it's like, oh, did I miss the boat? Um, it, what's something like you wish you had known sooner in investing? Is it just simply that I wish I'd started sooner or is it something like I wish... Uh, I mean, just anything you can share that might be helpful for someone who's kind of like hasn't invested yet, but is interested in like being a passive or active investor. What would you say to like kind of get their butt out of the seat and start moving? Um, I, there's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got we got time. We got some time. So. <laughs> it's so hard. I mean, just like passively, right? Like what is your biggest five-year dream from now? And like, what will financially help you get there? And like immediately that makes me want to invest, right? Cause I know in five, typically five years, cause most business plans, right. Could be from three to seven. So if I go in the middle at five, if I have a potential to have like doubled my money by that time, can I fulfill that dream? Can I go on that trip? Can I fulfill that goal? Right. Cause that's huge. Or can I pay off that debt? Um, like there are so many things that I think about when it comes to like, okay, like, for example, I, for some reason, love ATM deals. <laughs> and Me so too. I, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, we do ATM deals. <laughs> yeah. So like every month I know I'm getting like, and it, this is all dependent, but like for a $52,000 investment, right? Like I'm getting a little over a thousand dollars a month. So I've invested in this deal multiple times and it's like, okay, what are my like monthly expenses and how can I make my passive investments pay for those so that I can save the rest of my money to put my money into something else again. Like the biggest thing to me is like your bills can be paid for passively mm -hmm. by passive investments. Why would you want anything other than a passive investment to pay for all of your bills? Like, and that's, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and that's the whole thing about passive is that, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, um, we're, we're doing a time for money trade, you know, whether you're a physician, I worked with a couple of physicians that made over $3 million a year and yet they were working 60 or 80 hours a week. And I looked at them as like, I don't envy this lifestyle. Like, I think, you know, you're making yeah. a lot of money, but like, unless you learn how to make money when you sleep, you'll work until you die. So it's just the idea of like, and I just had a call actually right before this, where there's a guy on who's a, uh, a medical professional and he, you know, it's like, I, you know, the first thing you get is you have to get that this isn't just an, an idea and a concept, right? Until you've done it, it just sounds like this crazy idea. And then once you start getting 
the monthly cash flow from an ATM deal, like what we do, or you're doing quarterly yeah. distributions. It's like the whole world opens up and you're like, oh my gosh, this is actually like, it's weird from like understanding it's real, to like actually experiencing it. And then you're like, okay, I actually can start shifting my, my life. And I've just watched it again. And people get a little, they kind of dip their toe in and all of a sudden they're like, I had three investors like put close to a million dollars in with me over the last year. And it's amazing, right? It's really humbling, but it's also like, but they see how it works. And then they see like, wow, like this is something that actually I can use to replace my income. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I see a big thing is that people think that they need the money to just sit in their savings account, but like it's been sitting there and you haven't needed it yet. Like it has, it has a home somewhere else where it can build another home for itself. You know, like, it's just that too, is that it doesn't need to just sit it yeah, like, yeah. cause it can sit somewhere else and make money sitting somewhere else. And like, why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you want that? Yeah. I don't, yeah. I wish I could explain. Cause like, we're just as <laughs> passive as we are active. And so I don't just say like being active is great and amazing. Come passively invest. Like, no, we do both because we believe yeah. in oh. power. Yeah. 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 And, that, and that's the thing. Like I, this other investor I just spoke with was like, he was like, oh, I should be active, whatever. And I was like, but you know, you have a million dollars. You've got like, why don't you like try passive? Like it's, but like I do passive and I do active and eventually I want to be fully passive, right? I want to be fully like, because you have your time and the time is the most important thing. And that's the thing that people, I think will realize no matter how much you make is that you can always make more money, but you can't make more time. And so that's why, you know, Jeff Bezos or Elon, they all, everybody's got 24 hours, the homeless person, everybody's got 24 hours, right? Nobody's got more or less time. So that's the whole thing is how can you make it, uh, make it leveraged. Um, you guys gave a couple of book recommends. You, you kind of talked about the slight edge and then the other uh, David Allen book about multiple streams of income. What are the, any other books that have been helpful to you on this process? Absolutely. Who, not how. That's a great book too. Yeah, I've read that one. Who not hell? I could say like any by Ray Dalio. <laughs> yeah. Principles. Yeah. Principles of Ray Dalio is good. Uh, 24 assets. Um, There's, I do yeah. all the books. So like, like, the book, <laughs> I swear, like if you get a one liner from it, like it was, it's worth it. You know, like it doesn't matter, or I shouldn't say it doesn't matter what you're reading, but like the books that like people are recommending, like, yes, we will all have different experiences from them, but like it's the continuous reading that really brings those like continuous creative thoughts. And when you have more of those thoughts and when you're reading that other people are doing the same things that you're thinking about doing, like it, it gives you much more confidence because you're like, oh, I know the language. I'm understanding all of this now. Like when I hear these topics being brought up or when I opened up an email from somebody I now subscribe to and I didn't understand half of it before and you understand all of it now, it gives you the confidence to do way more like beyond investing. It's like, oh, there's people doing really cool things. I can be one of those people too. Yeah, exactly. No, it's reading is huge. And that's, I, I spend, you know, I think I've read 75, close to 75 books this year. And like, I just, you know, it's a huge thing. And I know you guys are readers and everybody that I know that kind of continues to learn and grow a lot of it's through books or conferences or just anything they can, but it's amazing what can open up. I'm going to check out that 24 assets book. I haven't heard of that one. Um, what I want to, as we're kind of wrapping up here, guys, I'd love to hear, um, and you guys have a podcast, which is awesome. I've been a guest on there. Talk about your podcast and also how people can get in touch with you and connect with you and join your uh, your investor club there. Yeah, absolutely. I'll let Susie mention our podcast quickly and then I'll talk about where to find us. Yeah, so our podcast is The Adventures of a Real Estate Investor. Um, and we chose that just because everybody has their own journey, right? Or adventure when it comes to real estate investing and how impacts are made. Like what what's, some people think as real estate investing might be like one color of shade, but it's really all the different colors. And it's like, here are people's stories and here are the impacts that each of them are making. And they're all different and they're all different in sizes. And that's really what it's all about is that the impacts that people are making through real estate investing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and if you want to learn, find out more about our podcast and about us in general, you can go to adventurousrei.com forward slash info. And that's a landing page where we'll be able, you'll be able to find our um, our podcast, our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just connect with Susie now or LinkedIn as well on there. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like pick your own flavor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Awesome. Well, guys, I really appreciate you for uh, living life to the full. I always see, you know, you guys leave Antarctica and Patagonia and all over Europe and 
love that you're doing that. So I love that you're you're doing that, but you're also adding so much value to so many people. So thank you for doing that. I want to really acknowledge that and appreciate you guys coming on today. So I encourage everybody to check out their stuff and uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you guys stateside or maybe in Patagonia or one of these trips, uh, one of these days here awesome. soon. Let's do it. Yeah, that'll yeah. be awesome. We'll yeah. just high five on the W trail. There we go. That'd be, awesome. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Sounds great, guys. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ross. It's been a pleasure. So what I love about this interview is that here you got Michael, who is a PhD student in England. And I don't know if we really got into that in the interview. And then Susie's in England as well with him. And they are just like, hey, what do we do? We're stuck here. And how do we make the most of that? I just think it's amazing. There's so many reasons why we don't take action. We can come up with a million excuses and many of them are valid. But in reality, just getting our butts moving and starting to do something is the biggest thing that changes our lives. My life really didn't change until I made the decision that I was going to leave my job within a few years. And I did it. And it happened just because I started taking action. So for you, I hope wherever you're at, if you're a passive investor, uh, that may involve getting on people's deal lists. Like we have deals regularly that we're doing. Um, there's you know, people like Susie and Michael that are doing them. There's many others that are out there that are doing deals. Then just getting, uh, you know, up to getting aware of what's out there, right? A lot of times we can come up with all the excuses, but it's just actually taking the actions. And so this time of year, I think it's just really important to think about where do you want to be a year from now? Where do you want to be at the end of the year? Um, what do you want it to look like? And, you know, it all starts with taking small steps. So I just encourage you to take some action. And then as you discover, you know, and they talk a lot about reading, reading books and getting into it and, and also people that you meet. And there's that saying that you'll be the same five years from now, except for the books you read and the people that you meet. So friends, I hope that you take some time to read a lot of books, go to conferences, go to a local meetups, go to events, do whatever you can, learn, 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 because it really will impact how you grow your wealth in the future. So Thanks for taking the time to educate yourself. We'd love to see uh, a five-star review if you're on iTunes. Really appreciate those. We do read out some of those live on this show, and uh, it really helps us to get great guests, uh, and uh, we continue to make the show better. So look forward to seeing you and hearing you on the next episode of Mailbox Money. You've been listening to the Mailbox Money Podcast. For more free resources, articles, and videos, go to BronsonEquity.com. There you can download your copy of the special report, The Single Best Investment Strategy During and After a Pandemic. None of the information shared here is an offer to buy a specific investment, and this is for educational purposes only. Consult your financial, legal, and tax professionals and use your own common sense before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us, and be sure to tune in next time for more Mailbox Money.